be here this morning. If you have your Bible, please open it up to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll begin our study there in just a moment. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning as we uh, worship our Father in spirit and truth to all the members here. Thank you for being here. It's always an encouragement to see you here as we start our new week together. And for those who are visiting, thank you so much for being here as well. I guess it's been a couple of weeks since I've last preached. I was sick last week and really appreciate all the prayers. Actually, Nikki and I were both sick, and we appreciate the prayers. Uh, and the one heart, one soul that we saw with so many people being able to help us out and thinking about us and praying for us, that really meant a lot to us. So thank you so much for all of your encouragement. Well, brothers and sisters, it is the election year. In November, we the people will go to the voting polls, and the question will be, who will be president? Do you have a favorite political candidate? Who might be the best choice? And is America headed in a good direction or a bad direction? Is anyone frustrated with the political system? Those are questions that a lot of people have. I'm sure you've heard people have uh, talk about those questions. Maybe you have those questions as well. But there is a bigger question for us as the people of God that I want us to think about this morning. And that is this, how will we behave during this election year? Now, you wouldn't have to think that this would be a question for us in the body of Christ, that this would be a question that we would even have to address, but it is. I don't know about you, but I often get nervous during this time of year. Do you guys get nervous during this time of year? Because of sometimes how people may respond and how people may act. And I think about as Christians, the unity that we have in Christ the unity that we have in Christ, and how important it really is. Throughout the years, uh, you know, I've seen how feelings about political parties and candidates have divided brethren. And now preaching for 10 years, uh, I've been able to be through, uh, have gone through a couple of elections, and I've seen that pretty much each time. And there have been occasions where brothers and sisters in Christ have shared their feelings with me in a variety of ways, maybe a one-on-one -on -one conversation or on Facebook or things like that. There was one brother who told me that, that he just was not going to discuss politics at all. He just wasn't going to talk about it at all. And then there was a sister in Christ who told me that she dreads this time of year because of things that are seen or done on social media. So the, the question is, what about you? How do you feel during this time of year? And we're beginning, as you know, a special series of lessons for the next four Sundays, technically it was to begin last Sunday, uh, but I just wasn't here. And so uh, we're going to be talking about Christians in the election year. And as we begin this special series of lessons, let me just share a couple of things with you. Number one, let us always remember that our authority is always God and his word. Our authority is always God and his word. And number two, these lessons are not designed to tell us who to vote for. My responsibility is to preach the gospel, the word of God. And these sermons, these lessons here were requested by our shepherds, our elders here. And so I'm going to preach the word of God, and I invite you to study along as we go through with what the Bible has to say and some important things for us to remember as we go throughout this election year. I, I ask you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to notice in verse 17, and the reason why I ask you to turn over there, because... Peter reminded the saints in the first century in a couple of places, really, you could say throughout this entire letter, how they were to behave. They, were, they found themselves in some difficult days. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, Peter said, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. He reminded them how they were to live. They were to conduct themselves in the proper way while they were on this side of life. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2, will you turn over there and read with me please? In 1 Peter 4 verses 1 and 2, the apostle said this, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. You see where their focus was supposed to be? Well, the same is true for us, that we're all about going after the will of God, doing God's will. And our focus, our mindset, the way that we conduct ourselves right here, right now, 
should always be about giving glory to our Father in heaven. We read with me in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, let's listen to Jesus and remind ourselves what our Savior says here in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would remind his audience, and he's certainly reminding us, he said in verse number 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it become, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. We need to remember that, that we are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men. That should always be on our minds that we let our light shine before men in such a way, not that the focus is necessarily upon us, but in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about as we think about how we conduct ourselves here with the rest of the time that we have. And so this morning as we begin this special series of lessons, Christians in the election year, I want to share with you three thoughts that I think will be good to kind of lay down as a foundation. I have three more sermons, Lord willing, that I will preach and we'll add some additional thoughts along the way. A couple of years ago I read an article by another gospel preacher which really uh, got me thinking about this more and and some of the thoughts I'm going to share with you uh, came from some of the things that, that I read from him that I thought were really good. And I want to share some things with you here. As we think about being Christians in the election year, one of the biggest things that we need to do and that we need to remember, I know it's only February, but throughout the rest of the year, is number one, we need to be wise with our speech. I think we all would agree with that, right? We need to be wise with our speech. And let me tell you why. A person's passion for a particular candidate or position, if not checked, and oftentimes lead to sin. We need to be careful with what we say and even how we say certain things. And as we go through this election year, we turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Wade taught the book of Ephesians, and there's so much application even for us today. Uh, as you think about this subject as well, as we go through this year, one of the things that we always need to be keeping in mind and making sure that we do not lose sight of is the unity that we have in Christ, the unity that's already been given to us. Paul said in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. The way that we conduct ourselves, it really does make a big deal. It really does matter. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. As we go through this election year, we need to remember the unity that we have, the unity of the Spirit and who we are. We should always be careful with how we talk to one another on whatever platform that may be. And we need to be diligent to preserve what we have in Jesus Christ. I will tell you, my friends, harsh words, harsh words toward one another because of politics will only cause division. And I think it's very clear that there's a lot of division in our country. And harsh words, though, from us to one another will only cause division. Now, hear me carefully here. I am not saying that one cannot speak and express their views. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that we should do it in a manner that is wise. You would agree with that, right? That we should do it in a manner that is wise. Because if not careful, strong feelings and words, if not careful, can can lead to sin. One of my favorite books is the book of Proverbs. And I think more than ever, The book of Proverbs has so much application for us, particularly in this subject here. I want to share with you three passages as we think about speech, as we think about how we interact and communicate with one another, uh, which I believe is really important. I think that's really where many of the challenges often present themselves when it comes to talking about politics. In Proverbs chapter 10, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 19, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 19, listen to the warning here. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. There's there's times where we need to be wise. Well, all the time we need to be wise. There's times that we even need to show restraint because if not careful, things that we say can lead to something far bigger. Look over in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 32. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 32. As the the Bible here speaks about anger. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 32. The Bible says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. 
And don't we often see that as a problem in politics? Anger that just continues to grow and, and get bigger and bigger. But he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. Be slow to anger and rule your spirit. Being angry is not necessarily a sin. Paul said, be angry and sin not, which helps us to see that one has a right to be angry. There will be times when one can become angry. And listen, sometimes we should be angry with what takes place in politics and what takes place sometimes in this country. But there's still a right way to handle it. There's still a right way to speak with one another and controlling ourselves. Be wise with your speech. Look over in Proverbs chapter 17, please. And if you're writing this down, Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 27 and 28. I love this one here. He who restrains his words has knowledge. He who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit. Don't you like that? You want to be, you have a cool spirit. He who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. You see what we can learn from that? That we don't always have to respond to everything that someone may say, and that sometimes it may be best not to say anything. If we can take anything away from these verses here, we're reminded that we need to control our emotions, our thoughts, our words, and we need to be wise with what we communicate and how we communicate to one another. And I believe this is something fundamental and simple and yet very challenging because there are so many emotions as we start talking about politics in the election year. We will have these crucial conversations throughout this time. But this is how we can continue to shine our lights. As you think about 2020, one of the biggest things that you can do and that I can do is be wise with our speech. A second thing that we all can do that will help one another and also help people in the world is being very careful on social media. And I'm just going to say it, Facebook is a terrible medium for debate. It is a terrible medium for debate. It is amazing what a website has done for, I guess, now almost two decades. I believe the website was first created in 2004. Isn't that crazy? 2004? And now there are billions of people on the website. But isn't it amazing how one website has found its place in so many sermons? One website. It's been the ignition to many sins. Lust, adultery, hatred, gossip, division, laziness. And it has really deceived many into thinking that oftentimes are more important than they really are. Because now everybody can say whatever it is that they want to say. And again, people can say whatever they want to say, but the people do need to understand, and we, do, we need to understand too that there are consequences and that it's not just a small amount of people that see things that we post. We do realize we're putting things out on the Internet that other people will see and read as well. I know many churches that have done many lessons about Facebook, that have done many sermons on social media. Why? Because it's often... A great danger and one of the biggest things I think that will help us to maintain the unity because uh, I've seen this throughout the years where brethren will post something on Facebook they'll get in an argument on Facebook and then they'll meet up Wednesday night or Sunday at services and now how does that even work what's that interaction supposed to be and one of the things I think we've lost in our society is actually having a conversation with someone maybe face to face or having a conversation with someone across the dinner table, or going out for coffee and talking about some of these issues that sometimes can create division or disagreement. And so one of the most simple things that we all can do when it comes to this election is to be wise with what we post. And again, one thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to be the Facebook police, all right? I'm not looking at everybody's Facebook page and things like that, but we do need to be wise with what we post, with what we share, and how we interact. In Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 14, there's a great passage for us to remember here in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 14 that I think will help us out. And it's not just for social media, but it's also in different interactions. I, I bring up the point of social media because there are billions of people on social media. And many brothers and sisters in Christ were friends on Facebook or other platforms. 
And so at times, that can create sometimes challenges because you see what somebody has said, and now you start thinking about, well, why did they say that and things like that. In Proverbs 17 and verse 14, the Bible says, The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. I want you to think about that. There are tons of posts on Facebook where people are going back and forth. And people have that right. People can do that. But with what I have seen throughout the years, I have rarely seen people be persuaded or moved to say, okay, you know what, I, I have learned something here. I'm just going to go in this different direction. I've rarely seen that happen. And what I see happening more often or not is that challenges and fights begin to break out. Challenges and disagreements begin to break out. Have you seen that as well? When I started preaching almost a decade, or I guess over a decade ago, that was one of the things I really thought about because understanding who I am as a preacher and understanding that people are, are you know, I'm in a certain position here. And one of the, 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 some of the wisdom that was given to me when I first started was being really wise with what I post on social media uh, when it comes to politics. And whenever I break that rule, I always get in trouble. I al it always happens. And so I just decided, you know what? Just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean that you always should do it. Sometimes there's better ways of communicating certain things. And so whether you're posting things or even when you see someone else, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. It is often pointless to debate politics on Facebook because if not careful, it will often create damage like a dam that breaks. And there's something else. As we think about all the back and forth that takes place sometimes with politics on social media, we need to remember maybe Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. Maybe we've gotten lost with what is truly most important, what truly should be at the forefront of our minds all the time. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 17, as Paul was talking to the saints about how they were to walk, you go back to verse 15, he said, Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. There's an expectation that God has for us with how we conduct ourselves. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We need to remember who we are, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are, we are on a mission for God. We're a part of something great. We're part of something special. The spiritual kingdom. We need to be thinking about God's will and what it is we're going after and pushing and promoting on a regular basis. Social media will often get us in trouble. And I think maybe one of the biggest things that we can do to help maintain unity is to be careful with what we post, be careful with what we share, and even be careful with how we respond to certain things that we see. That will help us as we go through 2020. And something else will help us too. Remembering that our Father in heaven is in control. I want to talk about some other things, Lord willing, over the next few weeks. But I believe this is really foundational. And I know that typically during an election season, this is what you hear, right? <laughs> God is in control. Why do we need to hear that? Because it's the truth. We need to hear it every day. Our Father in heaven is in control. But a bigger thought to consider do we really believe that? Do we really believe God is in control? Now, let me just clarify a couple of things here. When I say God is in control, I do not mean that it's pointless to vote. I don't mean that at all. In fact, we have this great privilege, and we should, we should utilize it. We should take advantage of it. Christians in the first century didn't have the opportunities that we have. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't go out and vote. We, we have this right and this opportunity. We should definitely utilize it. And when I say God is in control, hear me carefully as well. I'm also not saying that we should not care about what laws are being made. Laws are very powerful. Laws can shape a nation. Laws can change how people view certain things with respect to morality. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about laws. In fact, we need to be praying for those in, in authority, those who are in leadership positions. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul reminded Timothy of this. We look over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and the benefit for us as well as God's people. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, Paul said this, 
He said, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Who should you pray for? Pray for everybody. And there are things that we should be praying for, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We should be praying for those in leadership positions. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, and I'll listen to this, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's something we should be praying for as well. And so we need to keep this in mind. When I say that God is in control, I'm not saying that we just shouldn't care about what laws or what things are being done uh, locally and throughout this country. We should care a great deal so that we can continue to lead a quiet and peaceable life. And when I say God is in control, it doesn't mean that there will never be problems. God is in control, but that doesn't mean that all of our problems are just suddenly going to vanish and we're never going to have any difficulties you go back to 1 Peter, look over in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter was writing to Christians who had been scattered. Peter was writing to Christians who were suffering. They were in the midst of suffering. And yet what we find is that his response to politics of the day, if you want to describe it like that, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he reminded them in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse number, verse number 13, he said, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that they, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. And that's something we need to remember during this time as well that we love one another, that we honor all people, that we fear God and honor the king. Those were the instructions that Peter gave to the saints who were in the midst of suffering. Yeah, they knew God was in control, but it didn't necessarily just take away all their problems. What I am saying is that God really is in control. When a political party may have the majority in Congress or Senate or a certain man or woman may be in the White House, listen, God still rules. He is in control. And this has been true in every age. Real quickly here, in the days of Exodus, in the days of Egypt, when the Israelites were in Egypt, in Exodus chapter 5, when Aaron and Moses spoke to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, And afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. That's what he thought. He would come to learn otherwise. God was still in control, even in the days of men like Pharaoh. In Daniel chapter 4, in Daniel chapter 4, while Daniel was in uh, Babylon, and while the mighty Nebuchadnezzar was ruling in those days, even this king would know that there was one who was mightier, the God of heaven. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34, the Bible says, But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will and the host of heaven. Even this man understood. There is one who's in control, and that is the God of heaven. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 1 The proverb reminds us, the writer reminds us that God is the one who's in control. He says in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Yeah, there may be men and women who rule and have great power and authority in our nation. But there's still only one who is ultimately in control. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? It means that God sees everything, number one. He sees everything. There's nothing that is hidden from him. And it means that we trust in him, not in a man or a woman or a party, because they will fail. 
but God never fails. Nations will rise and nations will fall. We've seen this throughout the history of time. Yet our Father in heaven remains. And it means that we should be focused on his great work. The energy that we sometimes can put into politics, and we certainly have that right to do that. How much more energy should we have when it comes to things pertaining to the kingdom of God, a kingdom that will never be destroyed? Let us remember, as we go through this year and really every day, that our Father in heaven, he's ultimately in control. And that how we conduct ourselves, it really does matter. Let's shine our lights and let's show people who we are, that we are the people of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this opportunity to come before you and to worship you, to pray to you. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful blessings that we get to enjoy in this great nation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with all of those who are in leadership positions, that you'll be with all of us, Father, that we will remember one heart, one soul as we go through this year and really every day. Help us, Father, to maintain the unity that we have through you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. And help us, Father, to continue to give you glory in all the things that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll begin Bible class at 950, the Gospel of Mark in the auditorium, and one heart, one soul, one another passages in classroom number one.